Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is November 9, 2021, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I'd like to welcome everybody in the live chat, beginning with TiVo, Master Lee, who is tuning in from Amsterdam. Great. We're going to talk about the low countries because they figure largely, or they loom large in this today's discussion. We have Corky Goss, welcome. Share freedom, two of my favorite words in combination. Michael Charlie, Piper Fogel, hi, how are you today? And uh, Gold Color Maureen, is that a dollar sign? <laughs> today we're going to talk about euros. Hi, Tyrone, Tyrone Sargent. And Swan 432, some fabulous frequencies there. Michael Charlie and David Detroit Underdown, yes. And Melissa Clear Warden in LCSW. Welcome, Melissa. All right, let me begin with today's talk. I really have some incredible information that I've been able to synthesize for you today. If I can presented in a rational, orderly fashion. And uh, But before I do begin, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that uh, there's been a strange disappearance here. And I'm, I'm broadcasting, by the way, from Sacramento, California. It's Northern California. There's a North and a South, uh, so far as the state's concerned. When people think of California, they typically default to Los Angeles. But California is a much more diverse politically and from all other um, markers. Uh, it's a much more diverse state than we're led to believe. But I'm in the northern part. I'm in the state capital of Sacramento. And as it turns out, and I, I need to find out more about this, haven't been able to follow up on it, but uh, it's been fairly well substantiated that the governor of the Golden State of California, Governor Gavin Newsom, who comes out of the Getty, he's not related by blood, but he, you know, might as well be. He comes out of that that Getty bloodlines, which by the way is not Italian, it's it's Swiss. These are energy people. And we're going to talk about energy today. Anyway, Governor Gavin Gavin Newsom is MIA, is missing in action. He hasn't been in his office at the Capitol right here, not far from where I am, in almost two weeks now. And reportedly, reportedly, he's convalescing at his private residence after having suffered from the ill effects of a recent medical treatment that I won't detail for you here, but I think you probably can infer what that medical treatment might be. Anyway, he's retreated uh, from public view, and um, we have uh, we have it on good authority that he's uh, trying to recover from this medical treatment. He took a booster uh, treatment of some sort. We'll find out more, right? And this is the person who is uh, at the behest of his handlers, right? Is enforcing draconian measures on the. Uh, the people of the great state of, of California, right? Which are, by the way, I I just recalled recently while I was doing some, some busy work looking at uh, songs and music that are dedicated to the golden state. But the state flower of California is the golden poppy. <laughs> yes, it's the California golden poppy. How appropriate. I think the people who settled this part of the country had some big plans for this state and it what it didn't end with the gold rush i think we're just beginning to see what the destiny of california is really going to be so it's really exciting being here at the end of the this end of the north american continent and um uh, to try, and it's really exciting to try to recuperate and capture the ideals of the california republic as it was stated in its charter and we're making some headway here. In fact, uh, we're going to detail some information uh, that will boggle your mind as well as to push us closer to this point of 
liberation, right? That's why I'm doing this. I, I'm not interested in the sensationalism, the wow factor. I mean, yeah, I, I it's exciting. I'm I'm really astounded by the type of information that I'm I've uncovered and I sh am sharing with you on an ongoing basis. And today it's going to be a real mind blower, as I said. So Gavin Newsom missing in action. Now this coming Thursday on a happier note. And by the way, I, I'm I. If I seem to be gloating about his misfortune, that uh, I'm not at all. In fact, I will pray for his recovery and uh, ensure I'd like to see him uh, back in office. And I'd like to see him also. Um, well, he, he went through a recall process, right? Uh, Larry Elder, a radio personality and a conservative, probably won the recall. But as you know, the elections are rigged. Uh, state by state and, and nationally through um, third party actors. It's not the Russians either. But yeah, I hope I wish him uh, Godspeed and good health. And so he'll be back in office and then uh, be voted out when, when the next election election happens. Um, because uh, there are much larger fish that uh, to fry so far as uh, the new world order is concerned. He's pretty low ranking. He, he's uh, he attracts attention, of course. Uh, his celebrity past and present uh, has gained him a lot of notoriety. And, you know, gosh, he was uh, slated to be president of the United States one day. He might not make it, but we we wish his um, his best health, right? His uh, speedy recovery. So this is on a hamper note. We have a show coming up this coming Thursday, and it's going to feature one of my favorite persons out there currently in independent research, and that is Mr. Manny Grossman. Yes, he will pay us a return visit this coming Thursday. It's November 11, same time, same station, 3 o'clock, here on Tube U, right? It's the it's the U that gives you the tube uh, this Thursday. And he's going to give us an update. Manny uh, Grossman is going to give us an update on his Son of Sam research. And if you didn't watch the earlier interview, you might benefit by that, or you might watch some of Manny's talks that he's done with uh, Jason Goodman. And he also, from what I understand, has moved a lot of his work, his content over to Subscribestar. And I'll ask him about that, how, how that's going. So without giving too much away, Manny has told me that he wants to talk about one specific individual and this person enjoys a certain prominence in the science community. Uh, interesting. A lot of these people who are, you know, if I, if you'll allow me to, to generalize, a lot of these people who are involved in the sciences think they have a free pass so far as morality and, and just ordinary, decent human behavior. And I, I, I understand the bulk of scientists are well-intentioned and highly skilled and trained and are innocuous at, at worst. But um, there's a subset within science, the bioscience community, as you have no doubt observed, of people who have a sort of a, I guess for lack of a better term, a God complex. They feel that they have the power of human life and of all creation in their hands. This is uh, an individual that, that might be suffering from those types of uh, delusions. And we're going to be talking about the God complex in the larger sense when we deal with CERN, which is today's topic. And uh, most of you, myself included, well, I won't say most, many of you, but certainly most of you in the chat room, have a deep, 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 deeply held distrust for CERN and its mandate Speaking of mandates, one of their favorite words, they think they have a mandate. And maybe they do, because what I learned in reading this great book by Nick Huntley, which I'll go be going through for most of this talk today, uh, they seem to do it. They seem to have a mandate. They are a mandate unto themselves because they have sovereignty. They seem to be enjoying political sovereignty. That is, they have the rights, privileges, and prerogatives of a nation state. Now, I have to check up on this. This is something that Huntley miss, uh, mentions, and I'm going to have to follow up on that. Um, 
but it wouldn't be the first entity that claims national sovereignty. Another entity that makes such a claim is none other than the Vatican. Speaking of which, this talk today, and I didn't plan it as such, but it's going to bring together several different threads of investigation that I have been pulling on over the last several weeks. Just uh, last week, for example, we talked about Father Malachi Martin, Vatican, his work. And uh, we talked about, uh, it was last week, the week before, the, the assassination of former General Secretary Dag Hammarskjöld of Sweden. Uh, this We talked about the United Nations and the underpinnings there. And we also talked about how that relates to the decolonization process that began in the mid to late 1950s through 1960 of Southern Africa, especially countries like Congo. And that's related to the assassination of Dag Hammarskjöld. It's also related to the bioweapons program that found its home in Southern Africa, a bioweapons program that might you might argue, or one might argue, is still very much in play today in 2021, right? It's, it's a continuity of research program with the agenda of population reduction, radical population reduction. First, they target the African people, the black Africans, the people south of the Sahara. And uh, by the earlier part of the 20th century, 21st century, right, 2020, 2021, maybe that population, that target population is expanded to you and me, right? So it's going to, this talk here is going to bring together a lot of these different threads. Now, most of us are familiar with this cliche, this term, this phrase, it's just really an ugly phrase, uh, just, just the the consonances of it. It's a dissonance to my ear. It's it's like a bad piece of music here. It's like a, it's an interval that just really clangs in your brain, right? If the phrase is build back better, build back better, BBB, right? There must be some sort of word magic, witch magic, right? W-I-T-C-H, not witch, but witch as in crown. Yeah, this talk is also going to be hearkening back to my Halloween talk prior to uh, Halloween, October 31st, right? It's witch talk, build back better. It's a phrase that was coined by these globalist engineers who are housed in um, the so-called European community, right? Uh, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, NATO. And we've heard that uttered by the um, Klingon uh, Klaus Schwab, right? And it refers in their usage, at least for our consumption, the public consumption, it's supposed to refer to a new, a dawning, an emerging political economic system, right? That's, we're going to build back the new economy because we're in, we're, go, we're in deep inflation right now I and mean, I hear all this doomsday talk about the economy imploding and the restructuring and um, uh, Bitcoin crises, uh, economic financial crises upon crises upon crises. I just should tell you, I should let you know that whatever happens, there will always be an economy and there and uh, society will exist. It'll persist. Uh, the Roman Empire fell. It was destroyed. It imploded. But Rome is still there, right? You can, it's a tourist attraction. Maybe the United States will be nothing more than a tourist attraction very soon when it's bought up uh, for pennies on the dollar very soon. But the point is there will always be, as long as there are human beings in, in communities, there's economic exchange going with one caveat. If there are no human beings, then there's no need for an economy. So maybe this is what is meant by Build Back Better. When they build back, they, meaning the globalists, the engineers, that's not going to include human life forms, okay? <laughs> and you know about AI, you know about all these uh, semi-sentient systems that are being put in place to replace us, right? Automation, I don't have to belabor that point. But 
I want to talk about build back better as a phrase, uh, not as more than a phrase, but I want to speak of it as being really at the, at the center of what CERN is, the CERN project. And it goes beyond the political economic system. More specifically, I will argue here that the CERN project is really a, a, a more of a metaphysical project, more specifically a Luciferian metaphysical project than it is a political economic reset. It's also more, uh, it's more than just a science project uh, program. It's more than just a, a, a plaything, a sandbox for very sophisticated particle physics, right? That's how it's being sold to us because that captures our inherent sense of human wonderment at the universe and the building blocks of life and space travel and uh, all the other goodies that are so fascinating to most of us. Right? It goes beyond that. And, and, and we're going to talk about today the supernatural, the metaphysical, more specifically satanic or Luciferian substrate of this project. And for that purpose, I'll get to it in a moment. We're going to turn to this fantastic book. I hope you'll pick it up. And uh, don't let me spoil it for you. Pick this up for yourself because it's chock full of information that you need to assimilate and go through very carefully. I'm going to be returning to this book uh, a lot more, not just today, but in, in the future, because it's very, very dense. And um, I'll have to admit to you that I was surprised how good it is um, pleasantly surprised, uh, primarily because of the description of it in that retailer run by Jeff Bozos, the retailer that ate the world, right? I found the little blurb there about the author, and I think he really undersells himself. So I wasn't really expecting much. But once more, ladies and gentlemen, I was reaffirmed in my faith in this explosion of independent research and thinking and commentary that is breaking the hegemony of the self-appointed gatekeepers of knowledge, information, and analysis. Your CNNs, your MSNBC, and um, Dr. Science, and all these bozos. The guy, who's the guy, Bill Nye, the guy with the bow tie, who's not even... Uh, a scientist, or Neil Tyson deGrasse. I think he has a PhD in physics. He's a PBS creature. But that stranglehold, or as I've called it, hegemony, has been broken. And this is a, another prime example of how we have loosened the grip of the monopoly of information and, and analysis that's available to us. And um, I'm encouraged. On, on, I'm I'm pretty encouraged over the last uh, month or so. Uh, there's been a couple of setbacks, like the uh, FDA's um, uh, edict. It's um, but there are some heavy pushback as well. Okay. So let me talk. Uh, get dive into this book by Huntley. It's CERN. The subtitle is Satan's Playground. It's independently published. In, out of Pennsylvania, and it came out in 2020, still fairly new. And uh, I'm going to see if, uh, if I can find, locate him and um, see if he wouldn't uh, mind coming on this channel. And uh, like Manny Grossman, we can talk about the book itself, how we got into it. Maybe he has some new information, insights about his incredible contribution to our um, uh a deeper understanding of what CERN is about here. Okay. <clears throat> As I stated at the outset, CERN is a political project, first and foremost. It's a, I'll say it again, it's a political project. Yes, brilliant physics, right? We can appreciate certain dimensions of it in Huntley. Uh, I think he has a degree in engineering or uh, maybe even physics, but uh, he does a really, and you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you because I have very little background and training in that, but he does a good job in going through the science of it. But what, to his credit, and I agree with him, the CERN project, it goes far more than, than physics. It goes far more than science. 
and it goes it complements this uh, luciferian substrate as i talk about it and i would go further and say that it is primarily a political project what makes me say this before i get into the book itself the one incriminating piece of information that i get out of huntley's book there's it's chock full of little bits of um information and facts and names that I followed up. It took me a long time to read it because every every, site, every mention of a name, I would go after it and look and see who he's referring to. And one gold nugget in particular that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy and excited to share with you today is the name of Walter Hallstein. Walter, W-A-L-T-E-R, Hallstein, H-A-L-L, -L, like Hall. Hall Stein, S-T-E-I-N. I had, I confess, I had not heard or known of Walter Hallstein until uh, Huntley mentioned it in his book here. So I checked them out. And I, as a result, I, I spent a couple hours just downloading tons of articles, citations, and mentions of him. As it turns out, he's one of the chief architects of the European Union and, of course, the United Nations and the European Commission. He has all kinds of hosannas written in his honor. He lived a long life, by the way, and I believe he was, um, I have to check more into it, but I don't know if he was an official member of the Nazi party, but certainly he had a thriving career during, uh, before, during the Weimar Republic, because this guy was old. He, he, he saw a lot of modern history. He didn't, I think he died in, um, is it 82 or 92? He lived a long life, a long, <laughs> productively evil. Oh, yeah. Okay. 1901. He was born at the beginning of the 20th century and lived through almost the end of it. 1901 to 1982 are Walter Hallstein's dates there. And so I checked it out and I found nothing but complimentary, flattering tributes to Walter Hallstein until I came across a chapter from a book, which I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find the title. And if you can find, let me know. I want to read the whole volume, but it's only chapter one. And there's no mention in the book, in the uh, excerpt that I came across that names the book. And this is going to be key, but here it's but this chapter alone, chapter two, is incriminating enough. It also substantiates my argument that CERN is a is a political project first and foremost. It's a new world order political project, more specifically. We'll get into that be before I get further into it. New world order. It's a a uh, an important. It's a central explanatory uh, concept which I use often, and I'm. I'm I uh, I use it in my own work, for lack of a better phrase. I haven't come up with a better phrase at this point. But anyway, Chapter 2 is titled, Walter Hallstein, Prominent Nazi, I'm reading here, Prominent Nazi Lawyer and Key Architect of the Brussels EU. That stands for European Union, Brussels, right? That's uh, HQ for the New World Order. And uh, not coincidentally, that's also headquarters for NATO. And it's a luxurious, uh, fairly new uh, uh, headquarter. It, it's building there. Let me just read a little bit of the background of Walter Hallstein to lead into the Huntley book here. It gets better. It gets better. It gets juicy. It gets into Saturn and entities and the Nephilim. And oh my gosh, I can hardly wait to get to it. But let's go through Walter Hallstein first. Walter Hallstein was a prominent lawyer involved in the legal and administrative planning for a post-World War II Europe under the control of the Nazis and their corporate allies, the oil and drug cartel, I.G. Farben. So we know, we know our paperclip history. We know about Wendel von Braun ad nauseum. You know, I, you know, I, I appreciate all that research, but there's so much, so much more there. And let's not just get stuck on these, on these same tropes, these same themes and keep repeating. Let's keep digging because there's so much here that needs to be revealed so that we can devise and craft our, our counter strategy. Reading further, it says, um, Hallstein represented the new breed of members of the Nazi cartel 
coalition. He was trained by legal teachers whose primary goal was to sabotage the Versailles Treaty, defining the reparation payments imposed on Germany after it lost World War I. Early on in his career, Hallstein received special training at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. You've heard of the Kaiser Wilhelm. Yes, you have. Okay, so he's part and parcel with this milieu. Reading further, this private institute was largely financed by the IG Farben cartel to raise its scientific and legal cadre for the cartel's next attempts, that's right now, at the conquest and control of Europe and the world. Okay, that's where CERN comes in. Now, this article, this chapter doesn't get into that, but reading in a complimentary, interactive fashion, dialectical fashion, with along with Nick Huntley, this is what I conclude. This is my contribution. This is my my take, my little twist, my little, uh, if you will, my modest contribution to pushing this understanding further forward, right? So it's a political project. Walter Halsheen is emblematic of the politics of CERN as part of this larger EU, United Nations, NATO, and American, because America has been sold off, not to the Chakam, but to NATO, by, but to, to the United Nations. In fact, by the way, I should state, and Huntley doesn't really get into this, but China itself is, is planning a CERN-type project that's going to be seven times larger in scope so there's going to be some heavy, heavy, heavy competition. And by the way, Japan also has a CERN project, not quite as ambitious. So it's not just a European, Swiss, French, Belgian uh, centric uh, project that we're, we're talking about here. Okay, another name before I go on here. And then again, this harkens back to the assassination of the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, a martyr to true world peace, not to what the United Nations and its so-called peacekeepers have degenerated to today, where they're involved with child trafficking, prostitution, drug running, money, you, you name it. I mean, gosh, it makes the uh, the gumbata of the old day, the classic days, it makes them look like uh, you know, choir boys, right? But a name that, again, shows up in Huntley that I remember from reading this book, an incredible book by Susan Williams, a researcher, and she also did the book that, that reopened the uh, the invest re, or began an investigation of the United Nations, right? They, they had an original perfunctory one, but they did another one because of this book here by Susan Williams, the United Nations, that is. And she talks about, but doesn't really dwell on, the uh, King Bo Doing Foundation. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, it's spelled B-A-U-D-O-I-N. And that is a Belgian foundation as you know your history of, of the congo and what later became the D democratic republic of congo it was a dutch colony probably the most um, important colonial possession in the southern part of africa it was keystone it had the cobalt of course the uranium which was later transshipped to uh to new mexico for for the um manhattan project uh, and on and on, right? Diamonds, of course, um, incredible resources. So 1960, you would have the hand, uh, King Baudouin himself went there to pass the keys of the kingdom to supposedly the Congolese for self-rule. But you know that never happened because all these different agencies had these stay-behind networks and made sure that the African people, the Congolese or whoever else, would never be able to compete on an equal footing with the other nations of the so-called United Nations community. They, and then they would be presented as, well, it's because their, their elites are corrupt and you have uh, uh, Emperor so-so and King so-and-so absconding with money and living the high life. And yeah, part, you know, it's true, right? By the way, this also brings in a, one of our presidents, uh, uh, Barack Hussein Obama, right? His uh, his uh, putative father comes out of this um, this uh, post-colonial, let's call it post-colonial milieu, 
where all these uh, nations south of Sahara and Africa were given their independence and um, told, yeah, go at it, you know, just self-rule and self-governance. We're, we're going to stay out of it. Of course, that didn't happen. Right. So King Baudin Foundation is still very much active today, uh, more so. And it, you might say that, that Belgium has even more power than when it had the physical uh, today than when it had the physical geographically based colonies of its earlier days. I think they were had a about a century run, 80 years to about 100 years run there. And by the way, uh, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Conrad um he he pre uh, presented a fictionalized version of what he saw up close and personal on the Congo River he was a steamboat captain or a steamship let's say and uh, that came out as the classic novel the heart of darkness he was initially i think on a contract for one year or two years or so it was so hor horrific he he split after 3 months this is joseph conrad so it's in our literature it's in our popular culture and it's here in 2021 and it's in cern as well as we'll get to in a moment because well let's just get to it now because the king bowden foundation is one of the primary funders of cern so they gave uh, belgium belgian it, it's it's elite gave up the congo the the geo uh, physical location, right? It's, it's physical colony and instead has gained the universe, the cosmos, it thinks, right? So it's of a piece there. Yeah, there's a historical continuity that we're, that we're dealing here. And we're dealing again with bloodlines. This also takes us back to the great work of um, Fritz Springmeier and Cisco Wheeler talking about uh, bloodlines of the Illuminati, whether you like the title or not, or, or even acknowledge something called the Illuminati is irrelevant. It, the, the, the fact remains is that the ruling elite are, are run along bloodlines. And the bloodline that out of which King Leopold, King Baudon, and today the king of uh, Belgium, and he might be, he could maybe wear the throne, king of the world is a person by the name of Philippe, right? But he comes from the Saxe-Coburg bloodline. And they were known, this is not me, this is according to historians themselves, many of them favorable towards the, the House of Saxe-Coburg, they are known as the breeding house of Europe, right? The reigning monarchs of England today, Prince, uh, not my prince, but their prince, Philip, and, and um, Prince Charles uh, are Saxe-Coburgs, and um, they have, and, and, and uh, the Low Countries, Netherlands, Holland, Spain, they, they had uh, monarchs, reigning monarchs throughout most of uh, Central, Eastern, and uh, definitely Western Europe, and uh, still hold sway through CERN now with B and their uh, financial pass-through institution is this King Bowdoin Foundation. And I never would have made that connection unless Nick Huntley had mentioned it in passing. Okay, now... Going into this book and preceding it, I, I wondered, I said, my gosh, you know, do you think that there's a connection between the supernatural power claimed, the mandate claimed by the Vatican and a connection between the Vatican and CERN? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I was not disappointed. This book is chock full of connections, some of them kind of loose and maybe even fanciful, but there were there were enough documented and well-known historical political connections made there to to answer that question. Yes, the Vatican is involved with CERN, and of course that brings us uh, it returns us to uh, Father Malachi Martin, The Kingdom of Darkness, and many other books. If you're on my Patreon, I, I gave you an, uh, an excerpt of his classic book published originally in 1976, I believe, um, called The Kingdom of Darkness, I believe, the book. It was about, the, um, about exorcism, and that's really kind of set off the exorcism awareness uh, since that time. Uh, some of you have uh, expressed some concerns about uh, Malachi Martin, and I, I will say that um, 
I have uh, one deal breaker so far as uh, Malachi Martin's uh, ideas and his stance are concerned. He believes, he calls himself a papist. That is, he believes in this doctrine of, of papal infallibility. Now, later on, he said he's more interested in the office as opposed to the personalities involved with it. So I don't know if he's backing off on it. And I don't know whether he is he is public was publicly propounding or purporting to subscribe to this notion of papal infallibility so that he could be left alone to do his post ordination research that we all have benefited from tremendously. I'm I'm not really um clear on that yet, but I certainly do not believe in papal inf infallibility. I'm not Roman Catholic for one thing. And uh, so, even though I was trained, I went to catechism and went to, to mass. I didn't, I was never confirmed as a Roman Catholic. I think I was too old. By the time I was 12 or 13, I was already, um, I was already a free thinker, uh, let's say, uh, an, an agnostic at the most. I've changed uh, since that time, but I, I never, I never was uh, confirmed or never converted. To, just so you know, uh, I, I don't have a dog in that fight. But uh, I don't think the fact that he stated that he believes in papism is a, uh, disqualifies Malachi Martin's research in general, right? We can get there, you know, to a certain degree, and we don't have to, to be 100% on the, on the same uh, page so far as, um, because some people in, in, even in the independent research, well, Oh, this person is uh, involved with it. Oh, they're they're dirty. You know, they they've been they've been tainted. They've they've done this. You know what? Hey, <laughs> you know, even uh, Jesus Christ had a moment of of doubt, right? And um, he was very forgiving of people who were less than perfect human beings. And I think that that approach can be <laughs> can uh, we we can learn something from that. Uh, those of us who who do this kind of work. Of course, remaining critical all the way. So CERN, yes, tons of, of citations and information here. We can skip this one chapter that he devotes exclusively to Tom Hanks. He's the globalist spokesmodel, right? He's in all these, these movies. Uh, he was in Angels and Demons. You can skip that chapter. It gets really good, though, uh, a couple of chapters later. And he poses the question that we all want to know. Page 157, see, I have my citations down here, reading from, from Huntley. It says, could it be possible that CERN and the Vatican have a very special connection, a very important secret, a plan to welcome aliens from a, another place, another universe, another dimension into our world? He poses that question. And I don't know, it was a couple months ago, maybe three months ago. Time flies very quickly. Yeah, I was talking about uh, the work of Richard Dolan and uh, Joseph P. Farrell and uh, John Mack, Dr. John Mack. He's a medical doctor from Yale. Uh, any number of people uh, talking about visitations of the UFO phenomenon, right? And that looms large in this discussion here. And Huntley doesn't really delve deep into it, but he alludes to it, right? But that's not all, ladies and gentlemen. The question that, that he attempts to answer yields some pretty interesting uh, information and connections in my mind. Um, we also talked about Tom Horn, right? Petrus uh, Vaticana, the last Pope, and his incredible research that is inspired and influenced and at bottom it, it, it comes from a christian position yet he has this incredible background and a facility in bringing hard science into it without just delving in a lot of uh, generalities and uh bible thumping type of discussion that's tom horn i have horn i have a great respect for him so huntley brings him into discussion not surprisingly and he mentions here, reading again, says, a well-known researcher and writer, Tom Horn, has said that he has some astronomers at the Vatican Observatory at the top of Mount Graham. He spells it G-R-A-M. It's actually Mount Graham, or pronounced Graham. Uh, this is one of the problems. <laughs> he, he needed an editor. He's not a professional writer, but 
even professional writers need, need editors and uh, there's some typos here but and i'm saying this because don't let it put you off the substance is there even because of these typos or certain redundancy i think a lot of this material started out as a blog so there's a lot of repetition from chapter to chapter there's short chapters but it's well worth your time and effort to read read the book book anyway it's really i think it's going to be a required volume in everybody's research library. So le finishing this sentence is um, the, the, his contacts, Horn's contacts, is they talked to him openly that they were searching or they are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence and planets that are inside our solar system, right? And Huntley doesn't mention it, but you know that what Huntley is alluding to is the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, or VAT, V-A-T-T. And this is on Mount Graham, of course, in the state of Arizona. It's been in operation since 1993, and it is managed or co-managed, or at least the front for it is the University of Arizona, just like the University of California, and I think they now have a partner in the University of Texas, you know, runs of... Uh, the, the Los Alamos facility. They manage it, quote unquote. Uh, I don't know what they really have to do with it, but it gives it that 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 um, air or that front, that legitimate front there. And just very briefly, this uh, passage here, when he <coughs> brings in, uh, Huntley brings in um, Tom Horn, it reminded me of another article, which I will refer you to by one of uh, my favorite researchers, authors. He calls himself a forensic journalist. His name's Yoichi Shimatsu. He writes about Lucy, this it used to be called Lucifer, this telescope, but now it's abbreviated to Lucy, L-U-C-I. And this is an article you can find on rents, R-E-N-S-E dot com, January 2021. The title of the article is Biden-linked Jesuits wrecked Arecibo Seti to avenge their Lucifer fiasco. And here he talks about, he went to New Mexico, Yuichi Shimatsu. He went to go check it out, and he gives us, I'm not going to repeat it, I'm running out of time here. He he talks about how the Vatican, um, getting back to our earlier statement here, is, quoting Shimatsu here, the Vatican Observatory, quoting Shimatsu, is a homage to the devil himself, or more properly put, the archangel Satan, former right hand enforcer of God, who sent most sent his most intelligent servant to colonize Earth and rule over it as king. End of quote by Shimatsu. And this dovetails nicely with Hunt, Huntley rather. And yes, he invokes that phrase, that concept on page 159, the new world order. And his argument is there's a green revolution, right? You've got AOC pushing it and other ideologues, right? But she's the front person, the, the visible person that we can, oh, I'll oh, stupid, she's an AOC. They want you to mock these people, just like Trigglypuff. We don't have time for name calling and calling it criticism or journalism or reportage, right? That's not really the gig here and we and i say this because it's very irritating watching so-called independent people like uh, uh shapiro and bongino and uh owen shrieker and all the oh yeah they're, they're so stupid you know i'm come on yeah mark dice oh my gosh that guy's about he's like a one of the worst ass clowns around there and that that's all they do is mock people and but the problem is there's just so much important work and and true type of research that's involved here, but they suck the oxygen out of it. And so they're part of the problem so far as I'm concerned. So, okay, Huntley alludes to our friend, uh, Father Malachi Martin, and I've already given you some of the reservations I have about him. And he doesn't mean, he, he alludes to him, but he doesn't, again, this is where an editor is important here. And this shows up sort of the amateur nature of, of his writing. That's the most criticism I could, I could offer so far as Nick Huntley. He, 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 he's not a professional writer, and I don't really ding him on that. I'm just saying that he doesn't mention Mar uh, Malachi's Martin by Martin's name in full. He says, the, here, I'll read you the sentence. 
it was said that several priests, and this undermines his his credibility. That's why I'm I'm dwelling on this. It. Quoting, it was said that several priests at the Vatican had died under very unusual circumstances. The first was a man named Martin. That's all he says. The first was a man named Martin. He was an Irish Catholic priest and a writer on the Catholic Church. He was originally ordained. You know the story, and there's enough information there for, for us to infer that it's Malachi Martin. But why not just say it? Why not just talk a little bit about his um, his work and why the Vatican would like to see him dead? But the point is, the larger point here is that um, Pope Francis is very much concerned that the leak, that this information, the skepticism about the Vatican as an institution was beginning to undermine its larger interests, including their particular research, as well as earthly and mundane financial political interest in the CERN project, right? And here... Here we go with Huntley again, it says his death, that means Malachi Martin. That's why it's important to identify him by name. His death was due to a fall in his Manhattan apartment in the year 1999, just four days after his 78th birthday. And coincidentally, the Large Hadron Collider was finally constructed at about the same time of his death. So he sees this as a Vatican plot to squelch ulcer descent and potential undermining of uh, their legitimacy, right, as an institution, as a supposedly sacred institution, at least by their account. Now, let's just a brief sidebar. This uh, Travis, so someone asked me in the comments last time, the Travis Scott Astro World. Wow, what a tell right there. Astro World concert. And it's been written up everywhere, including Newsweek. It says in Newsweek, it says that Astro World this year, a 30-year-old performer on stage styled like the gates of hell, the stage, while revelers entered a gig through a large sculpture of his mouth, which has been linked to the famous Christ in Limbo painting by Hieronymus Bosch, which depicts the mouth of hell, quote unquote. So that's uh, Newsweek. And there's all kinds of um, mainstream press uh, mocking this this uh, uptick in uh, claims that, hey, this was a, uh, a satanic ritual. Well, we've seen that many, many times before. And coincidentally, not coincidentally, it's reminiscent of what Huntley describes this uh, ritual with uh, CERN, this beast, this horned beast. He talks about it because he makes the assertion, Huntley, on page 179, that CERN as a nuclear facility is now, quoting from Huntley, is now the modern day Tower of Babel. End of quote. To continue with Huntley, says the goal of the Tower of Babel in Babylon was to open up new dimensions or portals to allow Satan's fallen angels to come through in order to give humanity the forbidden knowledge and the magical success that they deceptively believed would elevate them to a god or goddess. And you know what God did in response. Uh, God said, well, you're building this tower to become God itself, so I'm going to destroy it, and I'm going to spread humanity all over the world and make them speak different language so they couldn't communicate with each other. And here we are in 2021. Now we're communicating through the language of mathematics and physics with the same goal in mind, perhaps. That's not Huntley. That's me editorializing. Now, interestingly, because Hunt, Hunt, we're, we're talking about that, that uh, fiasco where eight people died by the most recent count at this uh, Astro World con concert, right? Huntley observes that Cernunos, Cernunos, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Cernunos was the horned god of the underworld. That's the thumbnail for this talk, right? The horned god. That was from that uh, Gothard Tunnel ritual you 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 probably recognize it right but that god's name was sir nunos seru ser nunos i guess c e r n u n n o s ser nunos um and i was not familiar with that i didn't know that that god was called ser nunos and of course it's not a coincidence then that this 
long tunnel, this project that that's linked up with this tunnel is called CERN. It's the short name. It's a shortened version of this pagan underworld God, right? That's what it is. And according to Huntley, who checked checked it out, he said Soto Nunos is a conventional name that people who are expert in Celtic studies, that is the, the name of this horned god of this Celtic polytheistic people who were involved in neo-paganism, uh, right? Swedish death metal, for example. We can call it Celtic polytheism. Uh, this is the horned god, Sirununos. It's the, it's the Celtic god of fertility, life, of animals, wealth, the underworld. It's this yearly, because the horns are there, and the horns are shed yearly. It's a, it's a cyclic growth and death regeneration that's part of this uh, pagan religion uh, cult, some people would call it. Let's call it a religious tradition, pre-Christian, right? Fertility, it's the antlered horned god. According to Huntley, he says there are representations of that at the National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. This is a Saronis type antlered figure, right? The, yeah. By the way, there was a figurine, according to him, that was found. I don't know. There must have been some sort of archaeological dig on the area where the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in Perry, as you know, Perry was built upon, built upon many, many, many different pagan societies. Right? And they found a horned god and uh, built on top of this necropolis, I guess, the Notre Dame. And uh, as I was mentioned, uh, I had a satanic dean a while back. Uh, she was the one that put in motion my eventual dismissal uh, from the University of California because I would lecture about, because a lot of my students were going into the sciences. They wanted to be become famous researchers in biology or physics. Uh, that was their goal. And they really didn't know what they were getting into. All they were thought was that they were going to pursue this incredibly exciting field of of human inquiry. It's, it is exciting, but not when you have to sell your soul to the devil as the price of admission. Anyway, this particular dean was a weak Wiccan, and she was involved with neo-paganism. She believed in the horn god. She revered it. It's the divinity. Uh, I, I believe she's at Harvard now. I think she's a, she's a specialist in uh, medieval music, a researcher, and uh, it would really be interesting to see what type of music that might be. <laughs> I wonder if it's the type of ritual, uh, ritualistic music that celebrated the pre-Christian pagan past. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on. There were, there were heresies uh, that um, the church called it, right? So this is the horn god that was celebrated. Uh, her her uh, holiday was Halloween over at uh, UC Davis. So there we saw the CERN Gothard Tunnel opening. The main character wearing horns, exactly like the horned god of Serununus. It's also known as uh, Dianus uh, Faunus, which I guess means faun, right? Uh, Debussy, the uh, Apremidi faun, um, the faun, right? The, uh, the spring or the afternoon of a faun, right? Because he was involved in occultic thought, right? So Faunus was also one of the names, Actaeon. He went by many different names, this, this horned creature. So, what uh, to con wrapping it up here, what this is all going into according to uh, Nick Huntley and people like Tom Horn as well, I, I believe. Part of the or integral to the CERN agenda, the metaphysics of it, beyond the physics, the metaphysics of the agenda, its purpose is to serve or to create a plasma conduit. That's his phrase, a plasma conduit so that these free demonic, these entities, these Nephilim, if you will, these de demonic entities that are housed or reside in Saturn, right? The black sun. And Saturn was a very much part of uh, Himmler's Nazi occultism, right? And Himmler got it from other uh, Germanic occultists who, who were um, influenced or practiced neo-pagan or pre-Christian religion, but that's the black sun, right? And he had that 
shrine uh, dedicated to it and, and researchers who were devoted to the study. Anyway, that's CERN's function. The agenda is to, to create a conduit, maybe call it a wormhole. Maybe it's a stargate, right? He talks about stargates here to bring these Nephilim, these demonic entities that are captured now on Saturn and bring them into our, you and me, our plane of existence, our reality, our world. And uh, according to, and I'll have to find these videos or these movies myself, but I think you have observe this as well as uh, myself, that the art world, the popular art world, as well as the academic art world is devoted to putting forth this, this notion of portals and uh, these entities traversing these portals interdimensionally or from other planets coming to our plane of existence. And according to Huntley, one of these films is called Symmetry which is ironic because part of the goal of Luciferian uh, hubris is to destroy symmetry, to destroy coherence, to destroy proportion, and in doing so, to destroy earthly existence for his own purposes, that purposes of Satan, right? So this is a film I got to uh, track down. Uh, another one was uh, called Collide. Again, I'll have to find that one out. And this is part of an initiative, and you'll see this when you research CERN-related activity. There's a lot of money. There's a huge budget, budget devoted to people who are doing performance work. They call it not art. They don't call it theater. They call it performance. There's a lot of money devoted to por performance and documenting that with new media. That's what that uh, Gothard tunnel opening ceremony, ritual ceremony was about to call performance. And you'll notice, as I've mentioned before in previous talks, that theater, drama, uh, acting schools, whatever they, they, they have been, they have been pushed off to the side. That's for people, for tourists on, on Broadway or for movie adaptations or remakes of Mary Pop and something like that. But there's something more insidious that was put in its place. It's called performance. Perform and its major uh, home right now in the U.S. is uh, NYU, New York University. And I had a colleague over there who would come and look at my work and, and listen to my lectures and see who I was coming through. And she took a lot of information, was able to market it to NYU, and she got a job there. <laughs> because they wanted, she was harvesting my energy and my insights to take it to there so that they can put forth the performance agenda. By the way, those are the, the crazies that, that people laugh about on, let's say, the Alex Jones show. Oh, Trigley, oh, those stupid, oh, they're all crying. And, uh, that's comes. Those people are trained from performance studies. That, that comes out of the late 60s, supposedly was... Uh, owing to uh, civil rights activism and the women's movement, gay rights and all that. Uh, that's how it was marketed. But really, it's, um, its purpose is Luciferian reenactment of their power trip, of their power rituals. And the university is the site where these primarily females and primarily lesbians are trained uh, to go into Antifa and say, yes, we are your winged goddesses worship us we are black lives matter yeah we are black lives dark matter All right that's part of the witch magic that these people are using black dark lives matter dark matter dark matter is the occult matter all right to conclude then i will circle back to the top of my talk here and and reassert that we're not, we're looking at more than a physics enterprise we're looking at more than a conclave of really highly sophisticated research persons and their assistants who are the performance artists and the filmmakers and all these cutting edge maria you think Maria Abramovich was was uh, transgressive. That's one of their favorite terms. No, there's some people out there who will just blow your mind that will make 
uh, Maria Marina Abramovich look like a Girl Scout. All right. So I'm bringing it back to the top. This is primarily, CERN is primarily a political economic project. Secondly, it's a multinational science initiative. It's a political economic project to return Lucifer or Satan, if you will, to planet Earth, to our earthly existence and his dark angels assistance known biblically as uh, Nephilim, right? And how do I know this? Well, as it turns out, one of a name that you probably know was, and I'll have to check this out because he doesn't go into it. Huntley doesn't go into it. He mentions that John J. McCloy, who was known in the establishment itself as the chairman, the chairman of what? Portals, the Germans of Lucifer, but they knew him as the chairman. There's a book by an excellent one, a biography of John McCloy called The Chairman. By the way, John McCloy was also the person who, who put my people, Japanese Americans, in, in concentration camps during World War II. Uh, that was just a run, run through. That was a run. That was an exercise to, to what's going on today in 2020. That's the same guy, the chairman, John J. McCloy. But as it turns out, John J. McCloy was one of the architects, along with this guy named Walter uh, Hilstein, or Hallstein rather, Walter Hallstein, along with him, right? These retooled, redressed, uh, sort of retread Nazis, right? John McCloy, Walter uh, Hallstein, he, John McCloy was, was one of the architects of what we now know as CERN, okay? So you see that historical continuity and you understand the Luciferian forces, the underpinnings of this globalist project that's being engineered. And now you will more fully understand why we are under such heavy manners as it's referred to in Britain, why we are under a lockdown and why the great governor of the state of California has been sacrificed ritually as a martyr to this new great reset of building back better. Well, I got a better idea. <laughs> Yeah, I have a much better idea, which I'll share with you on uh, Thursday. And uh, the idea does not include your agenda, Mr. CERN, Mr. Klaus Schwab, and you other architects of, uh, of your father, your dark father, who is Satan. No, it doesn't include that. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a lot of fun researching this in this incredible array of information here. And I had even more joy in sharing it with you. I hope you'll consider some of these thoughts, share this video with other people. This is important survival information. This is not strictly an intellectual enterprise. This is a, a struggle for human survival. Um, no exaggeration. And it's an exciting struggle. That's what we are put on this earth to do. So thank you for joining me here today. I will see you back on Thursday and uh, we'll continue the discussion there. There'll be a lot of mind-blowing uh, information, I'm sure, revealed by Mr. Manny Grossman. We'll see you there on Thursday. Thank you very much for today. Goodbye.